have missed your beautiful music. Merece. Thank you. <sighs> beautiful ones, beloveds, thank you for having me. It's beautiful to be with you today. This being human is not easy. I don't know you, but I am finding it harder and harder to be human these days. My heart aches. There is so much heartbreak in the world right now, so much collected trauma, grief, and outrage. Being human is hard. Can I be a tree instead? I have asked. Some days, I just want to be a little chamomile flower. I want to be that soft, that gentle. I want that to be my medicine, the medicine that I bring to this world. Or why can't I be a bird? I ask myself, to fly, to know the wind intimately, that way to move with the seasons, to get away from Michigan, <laughs> where I live. Can I belong to another species, please? Because some days I'm ashamed of belonging to the human race. Some days I am burdened with my own humanity by the pain I carry, my own pain, the pain of my ancestors, the pain in my community, the pain of the world, the pain of the earth. To be human is to have a heart. And what a treasure that heart is, although some days it feels like a really heavy burden. And to be human is also to be a creator. And what a thrill that is, what a responsibility that is. So today I'm going to be focusing on these two aspects of our humanity, this marvelous organ that we call the heart, el corazón and this capacity we have to create, to co-create a new future, a new earth, with the intelligence of the heart. Something that my indigenous ancestors knew before the colonizers came. Something I know in every cell of my being. So we light this chalice today as a symbol of love, as a beacon of hope, for the more beautiful world that our hearts know is possible, as Charles Einstein puts it. The more beautiful world that our hearts know is possible. I want to call on my ancestors, my Yoruba ancestors from West Africa my Taino Arawak ancestors from the Caribbean, my Spanish ancestors from south of Spain. And I want to call on your ancestors who live through us. We were created. I want to speak of this in my sermon, but on the moment of our creation, of our conception, the great architect that created us, I call her the mother, pull from these ancestors and these ancestors and these ancestors to put together our DNA strands, to make us each unique. And so we are here because of our ancestors. They live through us. And I call on to them to be with us today. At this moment, I would like to invite you to place both of your hands over your heart center. I like to kind of put them like broad because I can feel my heartbeat all over my chest. And so put your hands over your chest and try to find your heartbeat. Feel that vital life force moving through your heart. That vitality is ancient. It was passed down to you through your ancestors. Feel the rising and falling of your chest as you breathe. My heart is so loud sometimes. Hear it, feel it. 
Dear loves, this beautiful organ that we have here on our chest is so much more than a pump. Your heart contains its own nervous system. Your heart is comprised of 40,000 neurons. There's an intelligence to the heart. Love, appreciation, compassion, these core heart feelings can help us to downregulate the fight or flight responses of the nervous system. These feelings can bring us back to a regulated state peace and ease and harmony. Stay connected to your heart. Breathe into it deeply, softly, softly though. No pressure, no force. Long, deep breath into your heart. Soften your face. Soften your body. <coughs> Become soft, soft. See if you can find a feeling of goodness, of innocence in your heart. From that feeling of goodness or innocence, can you call on the benevolence of life, the spirit of life, of love, of goodness, that it does exist in this world, I promise you it exists, the benevolence of life. Now imagine that that benevolence is surrounding you, is protecting you. It is safe to feel this soft, this good, this innocent. Feel your heart, continue to feel it. It's warm, this glow radiating out into the room. Feel the kindness of your heart, its goodness, its sweetness. When I think of the heart, I think of the rose. It's so soft, the way the rose, I know it will open, but in its own time. So soft, so gentle. Please know that you can return to this space of the heart anytime you choose. May you return to it over and over and over for your own healing, for your own well being, for the people around you, for your work, for this world, for your community. May you return to the heart over and over and over again. May it be so. That was lovely. Reverend Mariella is visiting us today from Grand Rapids, Michigan, where she works as a community minister and spiritual guide. She is originally from Cuba, and after making North Carolina her home for 25 years, she ventured west with her family, waiting for the next adventure. You may remember her from when she was our intern minister here in 2018. If not, you are in for a treat. Welcome, Mariela.
I need to find the sermon first, let's see. All righty. Hmm. Over the last few years, one of the most useful teachings I have found is this idea that as part of our human nature, our minds are divided into various parts or personalities, not just one, sub-personalities. For example, there is a part of me that wants to go to that party, and there's a part of me that wants to stay home. There is a part of me that wants to be seen, and there's a part of me that wants to hide. There is a part of me that is a free spirit, and there's a part of me that is a lion tamer. There is a part of me that is afraid and anxious, and there's a part of me that is sunny and cheerful. There is a part of me that is soft, like that rose, so soft, and there's a part of me that is fierce and strong. Walt Whitman expressed this concept well when he wrote, do I contradict myself? Very well then, I contradict myself. I am large, I contain multitudes, end of quote. I find that so liberating. I am large, I contain multitudes, and so are you. Rumi also expressed something similar in his poem, The Guest House. You know it, Katya. <laughs> this being human is a guest house, says Rumi. Every morning, a new arrival, a joy, a depression, a meanness. Some momentary awareness comes as an unexpected visitor, end of quote. And so each of these visitors arrives with its own physiology, its own inner weather. For example, when my anxious part shows up, she comes with a flood of cortisol and adrenaline, making my heart race, my stomach sick, and my whole system get dysregulated. When she arrives, some of the other parts get upset. They don't like her. They want to get rid of her. The inner critic kicks in, big time. And so that is the thing about these sub-personalities. They can start fighting with one another inside, and our psyche can become a battlefield. What I have found is that in this Western society, many of the parts that are dominating our psyches are also the parts that have been, that are dominating our world today. These are the parts that have been programmed by the colonial patriarchal capitalist system that we live in. And I believe that to change the world, we need to understand and change the unhealthy, unhealthy programming within. We need to examine these different parts that are not just attacking inside of us, these other parts, but that are coming out in our families, that are coming out in community, and these parts are so much about control and domination. The good news is that because of neuroplasticity, our brain's ability to change and be rewired, we can change the programming. So our brains are moldable, especially as children. When an infant sea turtle is born, her brain is loaded with information. From the moment her egg cracks, she knows to walk towards the sea. She knows how to swim already, where to swim to, etc. A human infant, not so much. No? It's not a blank slate. The brain is not a blank slate, but it's not loaded with the information it needs to survive. So it depends on someone else to teach it those skills. And so the imprinting begins there. The ego, these unhealthy patterns in ourselves, begin to form there. I admit that I didn't fully understand the concept of the multiple parts or subpersonalities until a couple of years ago when I was invited by a shaman to participate in a sacred mushroom ceremony and I felt my ego vanish. My ego, by which we mean the default mode network in the brain. There's a part called the default mode network. It went on offline and it was as if for the first time my mind could be quiet and I could see these other parts of me 
that I had lost along the way because of the programming and socialization. There were these wiser parts of me, these healthier parts of me, these more loving, more connected parts of me. With the ego gone, we have access to our instinctual nature, to the full range of our human capacities. The ego is the result of that programming, that social conditioning, it is not our human nature. Here's how I see it, what I was saying earlier, that on the moment of our conception, natural selection gets to work. She picks this tray from these ancestors and this tray from these ancestors and these trays of, from these ancestors to make you, you. The brilliant architect that puts our DNA strands together knew what she was doing when she created you. She made each of us unique with very specific traits for very specific reasons. I believe that your true nature is the medicine that you bring to this world to heal this world. This is the dream of the earth for you, as Thomas Berry would put it. But then we are born. And to develop fully as a human being, we need to successfully pass through these developmental stages. We are born with these basic human needs or human rights. And if they are not met during childhood, we go limping through life until those unmet needs are tended to. First, as social mammals, every baby needs to feel safe and protected. We can, they get, the nervous system get dysregulated and we come with our regulated nervous system and we regulate the baby's nervous system. We are so vulnerable when we are first born. We can't do anything for ourselves. So it is essential for our humanity that we feel held, soothed and supported. As baby, we get stressed for many reasons, loud noises, a wet diaper, and we cry to communicate our need. And so if we are picked up, held, and made to feel safe, over and over and over, our brain gets wired that way. Our brain gets wired for safety and connection, and our nervous system remembers this. And so we grow up with this sense, with this inner sense of safety. The world feels like a safe place. But if we don't get that, we grow up feeling anxious and afraid, and we don't know why. Deep inside, we can trust life or others. We can trust that life or others will provide for us when we are in need. So, so much about this developmental state is about trust. Can you trust life? Can you trust others? to hold and support you. Another one of these developmental needs has to do with nourishment. If we are hungry and we are fed promptly, we feel nourished. Once our belly is full, we push it away, content. Babies often fall asleep drunk with deliciousness after a satisfying belly, a feeding with a full belly. But if we did not get the nourishment we needed, for whatever reason, we go through life feeling hungry. And, and I don't mean just food when I'm talking about nourishment. I also mean love and attention. Emotional deprivation causes tremendous trauma to human beings. Okay, then let me nourish myself for a minute. <laughs> Then as we get a little older, we are able to move. Hooray! We no longer need somebody to move us from place to place. This is freedom. We have freedom. We can go after what we want. There is that shiny thing over there. I'm going to go after it. We can grab food ourselves, put it in our mouth. Now we have autonomy, power. We can do things. And so if you are allowed to develop that muscle, you are developing a healthy sense of confidence in yourself, a pride in yourself. But if instead we are controlled, forced to sit down, buckled, if we have, our, our will is broken, if that is to happen. 
if we have helicopter parents that don't let us explore, don't let us be an individual, our sense of autonomy shrinks, our inner power shrinks, and we go through life feeling small and powerless. This is what the power over society that we live in and these parent overbearing parenting styles have done to many of us. But I tell you this for what is worth, take it if you need it, you are a free sovereign being. You have the right to be free. You have the right to create the life that your soul wants desires. You have the right to live according to your true nature, the way mother nature made you. All right, so later on, we go to school. You're still young and you probably want to be outside climbing trees and playing using your imagination, but nope, you must become a perfect little soldier who follows all the rules and walks in a perfect straight line at school. At this age, you also want friends, you want connection. Yes, you have the impulse to be yourself, but you also want belonging. And this need to belong usually trumps authenticity, especially if we didn't get the love and acceptance and nourishment we needed at home. So we begin to control our own true nature we, be, we begin to push down this part that society or our parents didn't like about ourselves, and instead we develop these other fake parts, these sub-personalities or patterns of behavior that are accepted by society, but what a high price we pay for that. As Rita Mae Brown puts it, the reward for conformity is that everyone likes you except yourself. There are other developmental stages that I won't get into um, that we must pass successfully to become healthy and whole, but I just wanted to give you a few examples. And I also wanted to point out how the current systems in place, which are, again, about control and domination, about using power over everything, including nature herself, are not very humane systems. Some single mothers have to work two and three jobs and don't always have the time to give their children the love and support and attention they need to develop. Teachers who are some of the most beautiful beings on this planet today, thank you, are so overworked, so underpaid. Bless you. Bless you, teachers, for the work you do. You deserve better. So there are many examples of this, but the point I'm trying to say you get, right? Society is not giving us what we need to fully develop as healthy human beings. But the good news is, I always bring good news, is that at any age, at any time in your life, you can provide these things for yourself and for those around you. To heal those parts that have been exiled, we can now, at any time, provide those things. I believe that by healing ourselves and by creating community spaces where we can heal these aspects of our humanity, we can ensure a more humane society in the future. So how are you supporting these parts of you that are still limping through life because they did not get what they needed? Do you feel safe? Like safe in life or safe in your own body? I didn't for a long time. There was this anxiousness because I was not provided that sense of safety. Safety comes first when it comes to the nervous system. So how are you creating a sense of safety for yourself? Are you listening to the parts of you that is afraid or are you pushing it? Are you using power over this traumatized part of yourself? How are you supporting yourself and creating stability in your own life so that that fearful part can at last rest and feel safe? Then are you hungry? Are you hungry for connection with others? Is your soul nourished? You have the ability now to listen to that part of you that is so hungry and to give it the nourishment it longs for. Do not listen to the patriarchal systems that say that nourishing yourself is selfish, indulgent. Our very souls are hungry. And beloved, you know I'm not talking about consumerism here. You know that bigger molds and more stuff have not fulfilled that hunger that we have as humans, the soul longs for more. We want connection, 
deep connection. We want the night sky. We want art. We want nature. But again, we are so busy in this capital system that there's no time for savoring. There's no time for nourishing the soul. And also, do you happen by any chance to feel small or ashamed or powerless? Because that's okay. You have autonomy. You can now go after what you want. You can give yourself the freedom your parents didn't give you. You have the power to change yourself and to change these systems that are all about control and domination. Empower yourself because we need you in your power for the work that needs to be done ahead. And so this plays out in our relationship as well as in our communities such as this one. So are we providing spaces where people feel safe and safe to be themselves? Are we making sure that people feel held and supported in this community? Thank you for the meals and everything you're doing because so much is about that. If I get sick, will I have a meal? This has been one of my fears. Are we nourishing one another? Are we nourishing our souls in community truly? How nourished are we? How fed? Are people here free to express their opinions? Do, we, do they have autonomy? Again, this is here and in our relationships and in all of our communities. So those are just a few examples of how we can reclaim our humanity as individuals, but also in our communities. And I am preaching from experience, loves. Knowing what I need as a human being, listening to the parts of me that have been hurting inside, and bringing love to them, the love that they didn't get when I was younger, has been instrumental for my healing journey. Love is the answer. We have heard every wise person said, love is always the answer. The truth is that all of our traumas stem from a violation of our human rights or our human needs. These are parts of us that are grieving because where there should have been love and care and support, there was a violation or a rejection or a neglect instead. It's like we were promised these things by design, but we didn't get them as social mammals, and we didn't get them. And so there's this emptiness in there. And we must listen the love. My own healing has brought me to this understanding. Two years ago, I made a descent into the underworld that I thought I couldn't survive. I had finished a marathon that I had embarked on after the Trump election in 2016. I felt the call to go to seminary and become a spiritual teacher because I wanted to bring more love, more goodness into this world. I knew that more love was possible. But the five-year-long five journey, which included seminary, the long process of ordination, and ultimately my first job, our seminary, broke me in many ways. I experienced tremendous cultural trauma and the damage to my nervous system was shocking to me, still is. In 2016, I was living in Whitsett, North Carolina, about 40 miles from here, and I was reaching these really high states of consciousness that only the mystics could explain to me. I remember one afternoon walking in Country Park in Greensboro, I felt this heavenly feeling inside, this heightened sense of delicious euphoria. It was intoxication. Now, at the time, I had never tried any mind-altering substances, not even cannabis, none. I barely even drank alcohol or coffee back then. Back then, I would be driving around and tears would be flowing down my face and my children would say, why are you crying, mommy? And I'm like, it's so beautiful. The clouds are so beautiful. <laughs> and even before then, the parts that showed up mostly were the joyful and created parts of me. Sure, I had days where I was depressed. Sure, I had experienced anxiety. But I knew for a fact that the next day when I would wake up, my joy would return. My joy was my constant. But then two years ago, the sickness came. I would wake up every morning and my joy wasn't there. 
Instead, I would wake up with this wounded animal inside, this anxiety, I would be shaking. Everything felt like too much. Waking up was hard, making breakfast was hard, going across town was hard. And the inner critic, the bully, would say, you have driven across, town, across the country multiple times. You can't go across town now. The world was no longer beautiful or safe. I was shaky, panicked even. My window of tolerance shrank, which is what happens after trauma or after prolonged stress. You need to understand that trauma can be something big that happens once, or it can be prolonged stress, many years of, of stress, or it can be a lifetime of rejection caused by cultural norms such as systemic racism. Depression is hard, beloved, so hard. I found myself living with it, not for weeks, not for months, but for over a year. There was no suffering like that kind of suffering, that level of hopelessness, thinking that it would never end because nothing helped. I tried everything. I was desperate. And that's why this shaman introduced me to sacred plant medicines used by some of my ancestors that's when my healing journey began, the best journey of my life, the hardest of my life, my journey back to my original goodness, to my natural self, to the person Mother Nature intended me to be, me to be before the programming, before the trauma. But healing is possible. Healing is very much possible, hallelujah. These days when everything seems to be falling apart, when it feels like we are being submitted to psychological warfare, when despair and hopelessness are rampant, it is essential to have a collective beacon of hope that will guide us forward. Life is beautiful. It is the systems that are ugly. Human beings are good, benevolent, altruistic. It is the programming that is violent, but the programming can be changed. And since the systems are created by human beings, the systems can also be changed. When we heal and reclaim our humanity, our systems will become more humane. And so how are we gonna do that? This is where the hallelujah comes in. Because neuroplasticity, our brain's ability to change at any age, we can reprogram, rewire the brain to be less aggressive and more loving. And it gets better. There is also something called neurogenesis. The generation of new neurons or brain cells at any age. And with new neurons, we can create new patterns of thinking and new patterns of behaviors and new systems. And how are we going to get more neurons? Through Mama Earth, of course. The intelligence that created you and that created the great web of life is, has self-healing properties. The earth gives us various plant medicines to help quiet the ego, to promote neurogenesis, to help us see the interdependent web that we are all a part of, which again is an intelligent web. If you want to know more about these sacred plant medicines, Netflix is releasing this um, week um, Michael Pollan's book, How to Change Your Mind, as a documentary. So this is one of the things that gives me hope. The self-healing power of the great web of life, if we can keep the Western controlling ego out of nature's way. And you know what else is bringing me hope these days? It is this gorgeous organ that we have here, el corazón. Many spiritual traditions have provided us with teachings and practices that for expanding our hearts and getting us to more, move more towards kindness, compassion, benevolence, nonviolence, and altruism. The human heart is the center of tremendous wisdom. What if the parts that we don't like about ourselves, like the anxiety and the depressions, are not illnesses to get rid of, but are parts of us that need our loving attention because they did not get what they needed? What if instead of attack and judgment, we come to them with compassion and love instead? 
Someone I follow online, Aubrey Marcus, wrote this recently, which speaks of this. He said, um, what are you afraid of? A man asked his heart. The heart did not reply. There is no one that will hurt you. I'll protect you. You have nothing to fear. Still, the heart did not reply. Tell me, was it our father? Was it our brothers? The heart remained quiet, closed. The man grew frustrated. Heart, you are a coward. Maybe you are defective. Maybe I don't have a heart that works properly. No wonder I can't feel love. The heart grew tighter, even closer. For months, the man walked around, falling deeper into despair about his defective heart. Then one day, the man grew very quiet, quiet enough that he thought he could almost hear a whisper coming from his heart. He asked with all the compassion he could muster, heart, what are you afraid of? And the heart whispered back, you, I am afraid of you. And the man cried. He had protected his heart from everyone, but the one person that could hurt, hurt it most, the tyrant inside. The truth is that many of us have a tyrant inside. We treat ourselves harshly. We treat our kids harshly. We treat nature the same way. Those are the parts that are dominating our world today. These parts need to be examined. We must face all the parts, especially the ones that live in the shadow. What came out of my dark night of the soul was a deep appreciation and respect for the underworld. As much as I like the sunny parts of me, it was in the underworld where I met my broken parts and where I listened to their teachings and where I found my medicine and my purpose. Similarly, while the collective dark night of the soul that we are all experiencing, this collective night, dark, dark night of the soul is devastating. I believe that we need to fully witness, I, feel, I believe that we need it, that to fully witness what these systems have done to our humanity and to our planet. The ugliness we are seeing is not new, it's just being exposed. We are facing collectively the shadow side of the colonial patriarchal capitalist systems of control and domination. And how we move forward now matters. I have been so moved recently by a quote from Reverend Dr. William Barber, who said that preachers don't get to stay out of politics. We are either chaplains of empire or prophets of God. And I believe this is not just for preachers, but for all of us. Also, because I don't use the God language, I'm going to change that word for love. So here's how I would say that um, quote. We don't get to stay out of politics. We are either chaplains of, of empire or we are prophets of love. I am proud to be a prophet of love. Love is my religion and my spiritual practice. They all outdated systems are crumbling. Together we are birthing a new earth. Let the wisdom of the heart, the tenderness of the heart lead the way. Let us become stewards, guardians of the earth. So many wisdom traditions, including my indigenous ancestors, have already told us this. I am not saying anything new. Love is the way. The earth is our mother. May we realize this before it's too late. May it be so. Beautiful ones. I, I truly, truly love you. Thank you for having me. It's been beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. The heart is such a powerful thing that everyone wants it. Everyone wants your heart. The celebrities want your heart. The politicians want your heart. Corporations want your heart. And so may you realize the power of your heart. May you give your heart to yourself, to your community, and to Mama Earth. 
We extinguish this chalice now, but not the fire in our hearts, not our commitment to love and community, and not the active hope for the new earth of our dreams. May it be so. Go in peace. Go in love.